All right, did everybody get a coffee that wanted a coffee? All right. I want to ask you a question. We're going to be headed towards Romans 1 here in just a second. And uh, you guys know the way I typically lead our Bible studies is a verse by verse. That to me is the most ideal way to do a study. Uh, obviously tonight and the past few weeks on Sunday nights we've been talking uh, really on a topic, uh, the elements of evangelism. And so I, I want you to know this isn't, the, this isn't the norm. This isn't what we always do. Uh, and so please show grace as we talk about this topic. We will get back to verse by verse. Um, but I want to continue to deal with evangelism and, and talk about that topic. And we're going to use the Bible to govern our conversation tonight. But I'm just, again, asking for your grace. So you ask, why are we not in Exodus anymore? Well, this is just for a season, and in due season we'll be back. And so I just needed to clarify before we go on. So tonight we're talking about unbelievers, as I just mentioned. Uh, we're talking about a biblical perspective on unbelievers, and so that's, that's the conversation tonight. Let me ask you a question, and this is also on your paper. What comes to mind whenever I use the word pagan? So whenever you think of a pagan, who do you think of, or what kind of person do you think of? An unbeliever. An unbeliever. Okay, yeah, right. That's a good example. Anybody else want to add in? Let's, let's throw this word out there. So beyond uh, a pagan, what about a heathen? <laughs> I think I was called that a few times growing up. But does anybody, how would you classify or what, uh, what words come to mind when you hear the word heathen? Meaner, okay. So it's, it has more of a negative connotation to the word when you call someone, hey, they're a Right. So most of the times when we use these words, it's used negatively. So if you called someone a pagan, uh, you would think of someone in a negative sense. A uh, pagan or a heathen, someone with no sense of morality. Uh, they don't care about God's word, about his laws, his commandments. <coughs> so, well, we're going to get to that in just a second. Yeah. Uh, did you know these words, pagan and heathen, didn't always have religious ties? So these words over the course of, did you know language, Eng, the English language, it evolves over time. Words mean different things in different points in history. So pagan and heathen in history, that, that word has morphed. It, was, it has changed. Uh, let me, let's define these words before we go on. Uh, to be a heathen once meant someone who lived on the heath or outside the limits of an urban center. That doesn't really have a negative connotation there, does it? That's its original meaning. So let me give you an example uh, of, a, of a heath, someone who lives on the outside. On my way home yesterday from University of Louisville Hospital, I went through Cordon, and on my way there's a road on the right. It says Washington Heath. So it's the outskirts of town, outside of of Corden. So when you think of a heathen, that's someone that lives kind of on the outside. Uh, now let's define the next word. Uh, the word pagan was a Latin word used by the Romans to describe an incompetent soldier. That's the original context of, of that word in the English language. So when did these words take on a religious meaning? When did they start, when did people start using them uh, Turtle referenced an unbeliever, and he's right. That's where, where we're at today when we think of the word heathen or pagan. So heathen and pagan didn't take on a religious connotation until uh, the second century A.D. So that's, we're removed <laughs> a few years, right? But a man by the name of Tertullian, maybe you've heard of him before, he adopted those two words to refer to someone outside of the Christian faith who wasn't a faithful soldier of Christ. Now today, when we hear the word pagan or heathen, we think of an unbeliever. Um, I'll give you a second to write that down. So we use words many times to describe unbelievers. 
And sometimes the words that we use affect the way that we think about people. So if I called somebody today, let me give you an example. The kids were dying to go see the parade after church, so we went. And they were, people were wild, kids are wild. It would have been easy for me to describe the people as heathen, heathen children. I mean, they're just wild as bucks. Uh, But the point is this. The language that we use, the words that we use to describe unbelievers affects the way we think about them. So you've heard it before. Oh, they're just a bunch of unbelievers. The words that we use to describe unbelievers affects the way we, or even our attitudes towards them. Sometimes we see believers as less than or inferior or our enemy. And the language that we use many times describes them as such. We need to be careful when we're talking about evangelism. We need to view them not as enemies or less than. We need to view them as lost souls in need of rescue. So our goal tonight, let me, let me just share with you where we're headed. Our goal tonight is to identify common characteristics of every unbeliever. All right? We're going to see three things that every single unbeliever has in common. The atheist, the agnostic, uh, just the person just living in sin, the idolater. Every unbeliever has three things in common. Everyone, it doesn't matter what example you give, they're going to have all three of these things in common. Now, these are on your paper, but I just want to shotgun blast so you know where we're going. They're all marked, every unbeliever, everyone outside of Christ is marked by common deception, a common destiny, and a common deliverer. Every unbeliever are marked by those things. Let's start with number one. As we talk about unbelievers tonight, as we try to get a biblical framework to work off of, we need to understand all unbelievers have a common deception. Let me give you an illustration before we get to Romans 1. There was a Chinese general whose name was Sun Tzu. Anybody ever heard of him? I I mean, this was an ancient Chinese uh, commander. When I say ancient, I'm talking about he died in 496 B.C., so 496 years before Jesus came. I mean, this guy was, he's old. He is old, but... He wrote a book that was revolutionary for military strategy, how people think through war. In fact, he wrote a book called The Art of War. And in this book, he describes all kinds of things. Uh, He talks about, I mean, he changed the way military works. Uh, He talked about the use of spies. He talked about the use in uh, war of delay. He talked about making alliances, keeping alliances, deceit, etc. But anyways, the point of this illustration is this. He is quoted saying, the art of war, all war, is deception. So the key to war is deception. Now, why would I share that illustration with you tonight? This is just a reminder to us that Satan is engaged in a war. Satan is the master of deceit. All unbelievers are deceived. They're living in deception, all of them. In fact, the Bible says this in in John chapter 8, verse number 44, Satan is described as the father of lies. He's he's good at deceiving. He's good at... uh, Deceiving folks. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 2 says that the whole world is under his power. So Satan has banded followers together that are deceived. He has an army of deceived followers. Now some of the tools that Satan uses, (laughs) we're almost to Romans 1. Uh, Some of the tools that, how can I say this? Some tools that Satan uses to deceive are, let me give you some examples, 
bad information. Uh, all unbelievers are deceived, and, and some of the tools that Satan uses is bad information. Uh, he uses uh, information about atheism. He uses false religion. He uses information about self-righteousness. Um, so here's your, your fill in the blank. And then we're going to look at Romans 1, 19. The rejection of the gospel is the outward manifestation of the inward corruption of an understanding induced by Satan. So again, the reason why me, I'm going to put that in the layman's terms for a second. What that means is many times the reason why people reject the gospel is because they're so deceived. Now, again, we need to understand when talking about evangelism, sometimes no matter how clearly the gospel is presented, no matter how passionate the preacher is, some people will not be able to hear simply because they're so deceived by Satan. In fact, look in your Bibles in Romans chapter 1, verse number 19. The Bible says this, and he's, he's talking about unbelievers here. He says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. You see, all people know the truth about God, yet unbelievers choose to reject that truth. Everybody has the opportunity to know about God, but look back at verse number 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, notice these next few words. It says, Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not by lack of information or lack of evidence that people reject the gospel. I mean, even in creation, you can know that there is a God. Let's keep reading. Look down at verse number 20, Romans 1, 20. It says, For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. One of the greatest questions for mankind is not, does God exist? There's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. One of the greatest questions of mankind is why people reject that God, that creator God. Uh, let me get back on track. Look at your paper. There's a question there that, that kind of beats the same drum. How is it possible that people can have a clear view of God's nature and attributes and still refuse to worship Him? Why is it that people see creation? They, they see all the evidence in God's Word. They see all extra-biblical evidence of God. I mean, even the law written on their hearts testifies to this fact. Why is it that people still reject? And here's the answer. It goes back to our first point. Because people are so deceived by Satan. Every unbeliever, again, has all this in common. They are being deceived by the enemy. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 4 says this. Our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who, who do not believe. So again, Satan is a deceiver. What are some examples of tools? This is on your paper. What are some examples of tools Satan uses to deceive unbelievers? Now, I don't want everybody to answer at once. We've got to take a little bit of time. Uh, just raise your hand. What about this one? A tool that Satan uses to deceive people is time and procrastination. He deceives people by saying, hey, you have more time. You can just continue to kick the spiritual can. What's another one? I gave you one. Pride. Uh, 
I would, I would couple, I would marry that with religion. Did you know Satan uses religion to deceive people? If we're honest, again, Satan deceives. Satan uses all kinds of different tools to deceive people. Satan uses other things uh, to manipulate situations and to keep people away from surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. Um, let me fill in your blank, and then I'll give you some examples of how he does that. The, the blank on your paper is Satan. Satan has been given limited but direct access to the world and to those who live in it. And he uses that access to inflict suffering and pain on humanity. So not only is Satan deceptive, he's tricky, he's sly, and he also has power. It's limited, but he does have power. I mean, this world now, uh, I wrote down this reference, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse number 2. At this moment, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So, I mean, right now, Satan is... The Bible talks about uh, in First Peter, he's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to uh, to devour. So here are some examples of Satan's infliction. Uh, so Satan here on Earth has the power. Uh, we're talking about. We just gave a big old long list of. Uh, Prayer requests, illnesses, and diseases. Satan uses those things to manipulate. Um, there's some scripture references there as well. Uh, Satan also has the, the power to test believers with trials. Wait a second. Let's, let's just turn there for a second. Luke 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And then in Luke 22, verse number 3, uh, Satan has the power to uh, influence unbelievers. I, I, on your paper, I wrote possess. Uh, the Greek word is more influence, an all-consuming influence. Satan has the power to do that. Uh, he has the power to lead people into a life of gossip and usefulness uselessness. I mean, he's so deceptive. And let me ask a question before we go on, because we need to properly understand unbelievers. But here's a question in regard to spiritual warfare. Uh, is Satan's work limited to unbelievers? You guys are exactly right. So what are some examples of how Satan can influence believers? Doubt, yep. For some more example, Mr. Greg's right. I'm just fishing. I'm, I'm trying to ask. Right? Yeah, exactly right. All right, I want to give you some examples I come up with this past week. Uh, he can encourage a lack of forgiveness. Uh, Satan can work in our lives to where we hold grudges against other people. Uh, we don't forgive as Christ forgives. Satan can work in marriages. He can drive a wedge between spouses. Um, I mean, Satan can work in so many different ways. There's another example there of Ananias and Sapphira uh, in Scripture, about greed and deception. All right, so we need to get back on, on topic here. So, we're going back to the reality that all unbelievers are deceived. They all have that in common. Your lost neighbor is deceived. You, before Christ found you, you were deceived. Your grandson that you're trying to invest in his life, he's not surrendered to Christ yet. He is also, we need to understand, Satan is actively trying to deceive him right now. So, what's our job? If Satan is actively trying to deceive people, do we just sit on the sidelines? What is our job as Great Commission Christians? What are we supposed to do? 
our job is not to go in and bind up Satan. That's not our job as a believer. Our job is to break the cycle of deception with the truth, by presenting the truth. So if, if Satan's out there spreading lies, our job as ministers of the gospel is to go in and to speak and to share and to live and to pursue truth. That's The gospel is God's gracious warning that, hey, all you deceived people are headed towards destruction. But somebody has come, a redeemer has come. You were hopeless, you were helpless without Christ. You're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed towards a sinner, sinner's hell. But the gospel is that God has interceded and He's made a way. You don't have to be destroyed. So our, God, our goal, our mission is to share, to redirect. There is a global destruction coming and it can be avoided through a relationship with Christ. So again, Satan is blinded um, believers. And there's so much here. Um, talking about Satan blinding, uh, Satan deceiving. We're reminded also, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the parable of the soils. You guys remember that? About the, the different types of soil. Uh, the comparison to the different types of heart, hearts as the gospel seed goes out. Satan, in that parable of the soil, we're reminded that Satan's job also with unbelievers is to go out and to steal that seed before it's able to land and to take root and to grow. Satan does that in unbelievers' lives. He also uh, goes out. Many times that gospel seed lands and it starts to grow, but Satan comes in with the heat of persecution and scorches it and kills it out. Satan also comes along and sometimes that seed shoots up real quick but doesn't really have a lot of roots, and what happens um, during those times? Satan tempts uh, an individual with the things of the world, and they pursue after and abandon uh, their fake faith. They pursue after the world. So again, Satan's so involved in things, like I, I don't think we can even truly understand how involved he is. Um, Let's move on. I, I wanted to share, I may share an illustration at the end about Genesis 19 and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, if I remember, I'll share it at the end. But let's move on. We talked about a common deception. Now we need to talk about a common destiny. We're all unbelievers headed. That's what we need to talk about. Hebrews 9, verse number 27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So every, we need to understand, every single person that rejects God and His invitation, everyone that rejects salvation will end up in a common place. And the Bible describes that place as hell. Not only is all unbelievers deceived, all unbelievers are headed towards destruction and eternal punishment in hell. They all have the same destiny. Your neighbor, um, I don't know why this come to mind as I was studying earlier. Years ago, my one of my classes in college took a trip to Eastern Kentucky University. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you where it's at. I just remember getting on a bus and showing up, and we got off. And as we walked into the auditorium there at EKU, wherever it was, I think it was down near Lexington or something. Wait. Okay, yeah, so I guess that's where it was at. So we walk into the auditorium, and there's, like, there's not even seats. Nowhere. Like, we're having to stand. And a man walks in by the name of Richard Dawkins very outspoken, I guess you would call him an atheist. And so I didn't know what I was getting into. I was 17, walking in, and I hear this guy start speaking, and he just starts bashing Christians. And in that moment, like, I was mad. Like, fleshly thoughts come through my mind. Like, who is this guy to be bashing Christians? And all this, like, everyone in the room is, like, rooting him on, like, super excited. 
here's a guy that's speaking out against Christians. And this is this has been like 12 years ago, maybe more. But then as I was studying a little while ago, the Lord finally, 12 years later, allowed it to click. All those people were so deceived. And in my heart, I was so mad and, and mean hearing all these people talk bad about the Lord. But in reality, that whole room was headed towards the same direction the same common destiny. If they continue to reject God, like Richard Dawkins still does, they're headed to hell. I mean, I don't... So, your neighbor who's rejecting God, all those students at EKU that were endorsing and spitting in the face of a holy God, people that were literally made from dust... (laughs) Like, all of those people are headed towards hell. A lot of people, let me ask this question. Thinking about their common destiny, thinking about where unbelievers are headed, do you know who speaks the most about hell in the New Testament? Right, so the word uh, in the New Testament, Jehina, I guess that's how you say it in the Greek, it's used 12 times in the New Testament. 11 of those 12 times, Christ is the one that uses that word. And yet, still people oppose the idea or the existence of hell. All right, listen to this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 3, the Bible says that unbelievers will face sudden destruction. Now, what does that mean? Many times people twist this. What does it mean that unbelievers will see sudden destruction? Does that mean that they'll instantly be annihilated? Like there'll be no more? Soul, spirit, body? That's not what it means. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that when unbelievers face sudden destruction, it doesn't mean that uh, hell will be brief. It just means that hell will come upon them quickly or fast. Sudden destruction. Uh, We need to understand that's where people that reject God are headed, towards sudden destruction. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, tells us that the burning from hell will continue throughout eternity. There's enough fuel for the fire that it will burn forever. We need to, again, convey this in our efforts in our evangelistic efforts, this is something we need to accurately paint the picture of. It's not like you go, you you see this especially, I'm not, there are many denominations that say that you will experience punishment, but it's only temporarily. We call that annihilationism. Eventually, it's just burn up and you don't have to go throughout. But that's simply not true biblically. Uh, There is no relief for the one who dies without Christ. The Bible speaks specifically about the eternal nature of this torment. Listen to this. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, uh, calls this everlasting destruction. It continues on and on and on. So this is where unbelievers are headed. Many times people ask the question, well, is God just in the extent of this punishment? Is God just in in allowing someone to... I'm telling you, I had to deal with this. Uh, A couple of years ago when I was writing something for school, it doesn't matter what it was, but uh, I kept having to filter through all these ideologies about what people believed about death and what happens the moment after death. And you would be surprised. Like 80% of of scholars out there, or, or I made that statistic up, by the way, don't quote me on that, But there's so many people that believe after an unbeliever dies, the duration of their punishment is only a short amount of time. You would be surprised if well-known people who I once thought was solid, they don't believe in a long duration of hell. Why? It stems back to their view of God. God's compassionate and God is loving. So He's not going to allow someone to continue to be punished throughout all eternity. There's going to be a hope of relief eventually. They'll pay the price. 
So is it just for God to punish someone eternally in hell? It's not. When we think about hell, we need to keep in mind it's not only what the sinner has done, but who they sinned against. Let me give you another illustration. Let me say this first. Since we sinned against a holy God, we are not unjustly punished to suffer eternally. Back years and years ago, seven babies ago, and eight years of school ago, Believe it or not, your pastor used to wear shorts, and he would get out on the grass field and kick a soccer ball around. I know it's silly, right? I haven't done that in a long time. But if used to, your pastor played soccer, or attempted to. Let me put it that way. Let me give you an illustration about the severity of punishment through a simple sports illustration. So in soccer, the coach always put me on defense, and I loved it because I like to see people hurt and so when somebody's coming towards the goal and I would just pick them out and I knew hey the goal is don't let them get near the goal do whatever it takes and so uh, one of my coaches taught me how to do a slide tackle you guys may have heard this before the goal is to hit the ball take it out of bounds or just get it just get it out and uh, that way the rest of the team has time to get back and do a more fuller robust defense but anyways in my flesh and in my immaturity, I like to slide tackle any way that I could. So I wasn't just aiming for the ball. I was aiming for ankles. I was coming in from behind. And so naturally, the referee would issue me these neat little yellow cards. And uh, these yellow cards were to remind me that I wasn't supposed to do that. It was a penalty. Uh, and that was a just penalty. Uh, eventually, you got a couple of them, and they issued you a different color card. I'll tell you that in a second. But anyways, the the punishment severity matched the crime. We'll use it that way. Uh, Now, what if I would have went up and I said, man, I'm tired of that guy, that referee giving me yellow cards. I'm going to slide tackle the referee. Do you know what color card I would have received at that point? A red card. I would have been ejected from the game. Uh, The point I'm trying to get at here is that If I slide tackle a referee, I would get suspended from the game, unlike just getting a free kick for the other team. The offense is measurable to the one that we offended. So for us, we need to keep in mind, God is indefinitely more elevated than a referee. (laughs) Does that make any sense at all? So when we talk about punishment of hell, when we talk about the severity of the crime, we got to keep in mind who we've offended. We've offended someone infinitely greater than we could ever even imagine. Is it fair for a holy God to send someone to hell? Absolutely yes, on the basis of his purity and his holiness. I want to note something else as well. Um, Something that I think I, I really enjoy painting this picture, especially at a graveside or a funeral. The destiny of someone that is lost, we need to understand, is forever sealed. It can't be changed. So the moment that you breathe your last, the very last breath you take, there's something that takes place. There's a separation that takes place between your body and your soul. Your soul will live forever in one of two places. In heaven with Christ, enjoying his pleasures forevermore, or in hell, suffering eternal torment with no hope of relief. So, again, we need to keep in mind that when someone dies, there's no way they can go back and redo. There's no way that they can, biblically. um, So what happens to an unbeliever when they die? Well, there's a lot. I don't have time to get into all of it. Uh, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, talk a little bit about that final judgment. And we don't have time to do a full timeline. But understand that when an unbeliever dies, there's going to come a moment when they die, when they breathe their last, that there's going to be this sort of disorienting that takes place. 
we live in a material universe. We're able to touch, feel, kind of get oriented by things, gravity, all that. We need to understand the moment that an unbeliever breathes their last, they're going to be in this sort of disorientation. There's, there's nothing fixed. They're not living in a material universe any longer. There's going to be a lot of confusion. The only fixed point of reference will be the judgment seat. That's the only one thing, one fixed point of reference. And so who are they going to see sitting on that throne? Talking about unbeliever at this point. Who are they going to see? You guys know the answer to this. Christ is going to be sitting there on the throne. The throne will be white, indicating purity and righteousness. And at that moment, the destiny of unbeliever will definitely be, be certain. They're going to understand, hey, there's no going back. There's no turning around. There will be a verdict issued, and the verdict will be fair. God is compassionate. And so we need, we need the unbeliever to understand this is coming. This is the direction that you're headed. God is compassionate. He's going to issue a just verdict. God is so compassionate that he will show mercy to those who will ask for it right now. They don't have to wait and beg. God is quick to forgive, and heaven is reserved for his children. But God's compassion doesn't mitigate hell. It doesn't just go just brush hell under the rug. Those who die without the gospel will experience punishment. So let me give you the application so we can move on. As evangelists, which is what you're all called to do, we're called to be ambassadors, we're called to be evangelists, what, is, what are we to do? If, if unbelievers are headed toward a certain destiny, which is hell, what are we supposed to do? We're to warn unbelievers of their destiny. We need to tell them where they're going. But we also need to offer them an escape to, to show them you don't have to go there. But you can't do this in evangelism by brushing over sin. Many of our evangelistic efforts, we like to sugarcoat things. We, we don't paint an accurate picture of reality. We need to be honest, explain to them that Jesus bore the punishment for their sin. God's not going to ever overlook their sin. He has fully satisfied the wrath for those who will believe, in the place of those who believe. Let me give you an illustration. In 1791, the U.S. adopted this sort of tax, and this tax was on this distilled liquor, distilled spirits. Now, why did they do this? Why did they start taking out a tax? It was to pay for the national debt. Uh, they started taxing these guys in order to get a little bit more revenue. Well, these guys wouldn't have it. They start rebelling. They take to the streets, and they're like, why are you taxing our whiskey? This was known as, in history, American history, as the Whiskey Rebellion. Maybe you guys have heard of it before. So these guys take to the streets, and then uh, George Washington sends out 13,000 soldiers to kind of snuff out the revolt, and he does it well. Uh, the guys are locked up, um, but then over the course of a few months, almost all of them were released or pardoned uh, to a certain extent, except for two men. They actually went under trial. They were, uh, they were convicted of treason. Uh, and then they were sentenced to death by hanging. But as time went on, uh, we have a record. For the first time in American history, George Washington pardoned um, the first convicted criminal. Now track with me for just a second. These men were guilty. They were convicted. And they had a death sentence headed their way. Everybody tracking with me so far? But in George Washington's kindness and in his compassion, he took their sentence away. I want to go on record for just a second. I've heard pastors use this illustration and say, that's exactly what the gospel is about. We had a death sentence on our life. We had committed a crime. And then Jesus come in and uh, 
they say it this way, God has just gotten rid of our sins. Friend, listen to me. That illustration is completely not the gospel. God didn't just get rid of our sinning like George Washington did out of his kindness. Instead, what God has done in his grace is he is fully, he, he didn't get rid of the sentence. He had someone else step in to take that sentence, that death sentence, on our behalf. So that's, again, what we need to understand. Christ suffered the full judgment. The sentence wasn't commuted. It was transferred. Now, we are not only forgiven, we're counted as righteous. It would be as though, as though George Washington not only pardoned the whiskey rebels, it would be as though he stepped in and took the death sentence on their behalf. And before he did that, he awarded them with the Congressional Medal of Honor and put a statue in Washington on their behalf. Does this make sense? So God, in the gospel, we need to understand, God didn't show leniency or, or clemency, what he showed instead was the full exhaustion of his wrath on the only substitute that could bear it and would bear it. The wrath of God, and this is what we need to get across to unbelievers. We need to paint an accurate picture of the gospel. The wrath of God on the judgment of sin will be poured out in one of two places at the cross of Christ, or in a sinner's hell. So we need, to, we need to paint that picture for the unbeliever. We need to move on to number three. So we've talked about a common deception. Every unbeliever is deceived by Satan. Every unbeliever has a common destiny. They're headed towards hell forever. And we also need to understand, and this is where we're going to end tonight, all unbelievers have a common deliverer, a potential common deliverer. This is probably the most important thing we'll talk about tonight. The means by which every unbeliever is saved, there's only one way. There's only one name under heaven by which men must be saved. Whose name is that? Christ. Every person who is saved is saved by the same person. Now, I'm trying to figure out which direction I want to go here. It's easy sometimes for us to get caught up in evangelism and sowing seeds and wonder, hey, why aren't these seeds taking fruit? Why aren't they growing? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm telling folks about Christ. I'm engaged in gospel uh, ministry. I'm, it's so easy to, to become discouraged in evangelism when you don't see fruit. I want to share a story with you about the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul was sent into a particular city. I want to read you the story. Acts 18, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the vision by night. He said, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. So eventually the Apostle Paul found himself in a city, and he's laboring, he's, he's continuing to teach, and the Lord says, hey, I want you to stay there for a little while, and I want you just to keep plowing. And eventually the Lord would keep him there for a year and six months. And he kept sowing the seeds. He spent time in Acts chapter 18, verse number 11, continuing to teach the word. Now, there's no doubt that as Paul was being faithful and sowing seeds, there's probably a lot of rebellious people, a lot of people that really didn't want to hear. He probably thought at some point in his, his ministry, is anybody even listening anymore? <laughs> Does anybody even care? There's no doubt as time went on that maybe it was, 17 months in, people may have start, started getting saved. People who for 17 months have been rebellious. God made a promise in Acts chapter 18, for I have many people in the city. So again, the encouragement is this. As you're engaged in evangelistic efforts, don't grow weary in sowing the seeds. Keep preaching Christ. There's only, there's only one solution to man's problem. 
It's Jesus. Don't grow weary. That was the case for the Apostle Paul here. When the Lord was ready, he saved those folks. All right. On that same line of thought, we need to, again, keep in mind, there's only one solution for the lost. That means no matter who you're dealing with, who you're talking to at work, um, what unbeliever you're engaged in a conversation with, there's only one solution, and that's Jesus. It doesn't matter what religion they're, they're engaged with. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter what sort of sin that they're digging into. If he or she calls on the name of Jesus, they will be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse number 21. It's only through Christ. Keep this in mind as well. The gospel offers all people salvation. Listen to this. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Father bids everyone to come. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4 says, uh, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All right. One more illustration, then we'll be done. I'm not an art guy. I mean, I, I, you show me a picture, it's just not one of my hobbies. I don't like to stare at a picture. But I come across a picture the other day I thought was super interesting. Uh, it's in the National Gallery of Art. You can go, uh, our slideshow thing wasn't working, but uh, you can go home and look up this picture when you get home. It's called Ships in Distress Off a Rocky Coast. That's a pretty catchy name, right? It's back in the 1600s, a man painted this. But in this picture, there's three Dutch ships off the coast, off this rocky coast, and it's storming real bad. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, black clouds. The waves are huge. These three boats are carrying cargo, and they're just getting beat and battered, and they're headed towards destruction. In fact, a fourth boat is just completely demolished. It's already sunk, uh, destroyed. Now, in this picture, they call this type of art, again, I, I'm not super familiar, it's called Venetus. And in this type of art, it's to show just how frail humanity is, how helpless humanity is. And I thought that was cool. I thought, man, the picture of those three boats just getting melee off a rocky coast is a picture of the unbeliever. So they're, they're just kind of sailing through life. They're, they got a whole boatload of cargo they're carrying with them. And the storms of life are just, just trying to take them out, trying to sink them. The only hope that those boats had, the only hope that the unbeliever has, the only hope that we have is for someone to come in and to rescue. The only hope is a deliverer. Now here, here's another neat thing. I keep thinking he's going to pop. You don't have to. It may be a distraction. Uh, something that I failed to mention about this picture is in the top left corner, of this painting, you see beyond all those black clouds is light coming through, the morning light, the light of the sun coming through, it, the, the breaking of the dawn. Uh, it's to symbolize the end of the storm and hope. Now, in that picture, we don't know if the ship breaks or the storm does. But again, in my mind, in that little old picture that was painted a long time ago, it's a good picture of the unbeliever. They're sinking in the sea of sin. They're carrying cargo. They have no hope unless a rescuer comes. We as believers have the privilege of going to the people who are drowning, literally drowning in their sin. They have no hope. And explaining to them, hey, the breaking of the dawn, the sun has come. Uh, hope exists beyond the darkness. I'll ask just two questions, and then we're going to be done. Thinking of evangelism, and I'll be honest, I, I don't know how much longer we have on this topic of the elements of evangelism. I want us to make the most of our time tonight. So first question is this. 
Are you accurately presenting the horrible consequences of rejecting a Savior? So you think about the ministry that Christ has you in right now. We're all called to be witnesses. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. No matter where you go, what you do, what your occupation is, you're called to be a witness. A witness talks about what they've seen, heard, felt, experienced, all of those things. You're called to do that. So as you're witnessing to folks, do you accurately describe the consequences of rejecting the Savior? For me, many times, I express hate. If you, if you don't turn to Christ, you're going to hell. I mean, tell them, believe it or not. So what? <laughs> like, are we accurately painting the picture of what that is? What that looks like? Eternal punishment. No hope of relief. Next question. Are you then pleading with the unbeliever to turn while there is still time? Again, my, my goal tonight was for us to see every unbeliever as three things in common. We talked about those three things. But I also wanted to encourage you guys in urgency and evangelism. If now we understand where un unbelievers are headed, then there should be urgency in our conversations. So easy just to kind of be distracted. Remember, Satan's the deceiver. Hey, we have more time. But many times we're not given another chance to have a conversation. Does anybody have any questions? Tyler Hayes, would you close us in prayer tonight?